Where I Lived and What I Lived For, Walden, by Henry David Thoreau. At a certain season of our life, we're accustomed to consider every spot as the possible site of a house. I've thus surveyed the country on every side within a dozen miles of where I live. In imagination, I've bought all the farms in succession, for all were to be bought, and I knew their price. I walked over each farmer's premises, tasted his wild apples, discoursed on husbandry with them, took his farm at his price at any price, mortgaging it to him in my, in my mind, even put a higher price on it, took everything but a deed of it, took it for his word for his deed, for I dearly loved to talk, cultivated it, and him too to some extent I trust, and withdrew when I had enjoyed it long enough, leaving him to carry it on. This experience entitled me to be regarded as a sort of real estate broker by my friends. Wherever I sat, there I might live, and the landscape radiated from me accordingly. What is a house but a sades, a seat? Better if a country seat. I discovered many a site for a house not likely to be soon improved, which some might have thought too far from the village, but to my eyes, the village was too far from it. Well, there I might live, I said, and there I did live, for an hour, a summer, and a winter life. How saw how I could let the years run off, buffet the winter through, and see the spring come in. The future inhabitants of this region, wherever they may place their houses, may be sure that they have been anticipated. An afternoon sufficed to lay out the land into orchard, woodlot, and pasture, and to decide what fine oaks or pines should be left to stand before the door, and whence each blasted tree could be seen to its best advantage. And then I let it lie, fallow perchance, for a man is rich in proportion to the number of things which he can afford to let alone. My imagination carried me so far that I even had the refusal of several farms. The refusal was all I wanted, but I never got my fingers burned by actual possession. The nearest that I came to actual possession was when I bought the Hollowell place and had begun to sort my seeds and collected materials with which to make a wheelbarrow to carry it on or off with. But before the owner gave me the deed of it, his wife, every man is such a wife, changed her mind and wished to keep it, and he offered me ten dollars to release him. Now, to speak the truth, I had but ten cents in the world, and it surpassed my arithmetic to tell if I was that man who had ten cents or who had a farm or ten dollars or all together. However, I let him keep the ten dollars and the farm too, for I'd carried it far enough. Or rather, to be generous, I sold him the farm for just what I gave for it, and as he was not a rich man, made him a present of ten dollars, and still had my ten cents and seeds and materials for a wheelbarrow left. I found thus I had been a rich man without any damage to my poverty. But I retained the landscape, and I have since annually carried off what it yielded without a wheelbarrow. With respect to landscapes, I am the monarch of all I survey. My right there is none to dispute. I have frequently seen a poet withdraw, having enjoyed the most valuable part of a farm, while the crusty farmer supposed that he's got a few wild apples only. While the owner does not know it for many years, when a poet has put his farm in rhyme, the most admirable kind of invisible fence, fence has fairly impounded it, milked it, skimmed it, and got all the cream, and left the farmer only the skimmed milk. The real attractions of the Hollowell farm to me were its complete retirement, being about two miles from the village, a half a mile from the nearest neighbor, and separated from the highway by a broad field. Its bounding on the river, which the owner said protected it by its fogs from frosts in the spring, though that was nothing to me. The great color and ruinous state of the house and barn, and the dilapidated fences, which put such an interval between me and the last occupant. The hollow and lichen-covered apple trees, gnawed by rabbits, showing what kind of neighbors I should have. But above all, the recollection I had of it from my earliest voyages up the river, when the house was concealed behind a dense grove of red maples, through which I heard the house dog bark. I was in haste to buy it, before the proprietor finished getting out some rocks, cutting down the hollow apple trees, and grubbing up some young birches which had sprung up in the pasture, or in short, made any more of his improvements. To enjoy these advantages, I was ready to carry it on, like Atlas to take the world on my shoulders. I never heard what compensation he received for that, and do all those things which had no other motive or excuse but that I might pay for it, and be unmolested in my possession of it. For I knew all the while that it would yield the most abundant crop of the kind I wanted, if I could only afford to let it alone. But it turned out as I have said.
All that I could say then with respect to farming on a large scale, I've always cultivated a garden, was that I had my seeds ready. Many think that seeds improve with age. I have no doubt that time discriminates between the good and the bad. When at last I shall plant, I shall be likely less to be disappointed. But I would say to my fellows once and for all, as long as a possible live free and uncommitted. It makes but little difference whether you're committed to a farm or to the county jail. Old Cato, whose de rustica is my cultivator, says, and the only translation I've seen makes sheer nonsense to the passage, when you think of getting a farm, turn it thus in your mind, not to buy greedily, nor spare your pains to look at it, and do not think it enough to go round it once. The oftener you go there, the more it will please you, if it is good. I think I shall not buy greedily, but go round and round it as long as I live, and be buried in it first, that it may please me the more at last. The present was my neat next experiment of this kind, which I propose to describe more at length for convenience of putting the experience of two years into one. As I have said, I do not propose to write a note to de de dejection, but to brag as lustily as the Chanticleer in the morning, standing on his roost, if only to wake my neighbors up. When first I took up my abode in the woods, that is, began to spend my nights as well as days there, which by accident was on Independence Day, or the 4th of July, 1845. My house was not finished for winter, but was merely a defense against the rain, without plastering or chimney, the walls being of rough weather-stained boards, with wide chinks which made it cool at night. The upright white-hewn studs and freshly planed door and window casings gave it a clean and airy look, especially in the morning, when its timbers were saturated with dew, so that I fancied that by noon some sweet gum would exude from them. To my imagination, it retained throughout the day, more or less, of this auroral character, reminding me of a certain house on a mountain which I had visited a year before. This was an airy and unplastered cabin, fit to entertain a traveling god, and where goddess might trail her garments. The winds which passed over my dwelling were such as sweep over the ridges of the mountains, bearing the broken strains or celestial parts only of terrestrial music. The morning wind forever blows, the poem of creation is uninterrupted, but few are the ears that hear it. Olympus is but the outside of the earth everywhere. The only house I'd been the owner of before, if I except a boat, was a tent, which I used occasionally when making excursions in the summer, and this is still rolled up in my garret. But the boat, after passing from hand to hand, has gone down the stream of time. With this more substantial shelter about me, I'd made some progress towards settling in the world. This frame, so slightly clad, was a sort of crystallization around me, and reacted on the builder. It was suggestive somewhat as a picture in outlines. I did not need to go outdoors to take the air, for the atmosphere within had lost none of its freshness. It was not so much within doors as behind a door where I sat, even in the rainiest weather. The Harry Vanza says, An abode without birds is like a meat without seasoning. Such was not my abode, for I found myself suddenly neighbor to the birds, not by having imprisoned one, but having caged myself near them. I was not only nearer to some of those which commonly frequent the garden and the orchard, but to those smaller and more thrilling songsters of the forest, which never or rarely serenade a villager, the wood thrush, the very, the, very, the scarlet tanager, the field sparrow, the whippoorwill, and many others. I was seated by the shore of a small pond about a mile and a half south of the village of Concord, and somewhat higher than it, in the midst of an extensive wood between the town and Lincoln, and about two miles south of that our only, known, our only field known to fame, the Concord Battleground. But I was so low in the woods that the opposite shore, a half a mile off, like the rest, covered with wood, was my most distant horizon. For the first week, whenever I looked out on the pond, it impressed me like a tarn high up on the side of a mountain, its bottom far above the surface of other lakes. And as the sun arose, I saw it throwing off its nightly clothing of mist, and here and there by degrees, its soft ripples or its smooth reflecting surface was revealed, while the mists, like ghosts, were stealthily withdrawing in every direction into the woods, as at the breaking up of some nocturnal conventicle. The very dew seemed to hang upon the trees later into the day than usual, as on the sides of mountains. This small lake was of most value as a neighbor in the intervals of a gentle rainstorm in August, when both air and water being perfectly still, but the sky overcast, mid-afternoon had all the serenity of evening, and the wood thrush sang around, and it was heard from shore to shore. A lake like this is never smoother than at such a time, 
and the clear portion of the air above it being, shallow and darkened by clouds, the water, full of light and reflections, becomes a lower heaven itself, so much the more important. From a hilltop nearby, where the wood had been recently cut off, there was a pleasing vista southward across the pond, through a wide indentation in the hills which formed the shore there, where their opposite sides sloping toward each other suggested a stream flowing out in that direction through a wooded valley. But stream there was none. That way I looked between and over near the green hills to some distant and higher ones in the horizon, tinged with blue. Indeed, by standing on tiptoe, I could catch a glimpse of some of the peaks of the still bluer and more distant mountain ranges in the northwest, those two blue coins from heaven's own mint, and also some portion of the village. But in other directions, even from this point, I could not see over or beyond the woods which surrounded me. It is well to have some water in your neighborhood to give buoyancy to and float the earth. One value even of the smallest well is when you look into it, you see that the earth is not continent, but insular. This is as important as that it keeps the butter cool. When I looked across the pond from this peak towards the Sudbury Meadows, which in time of flood I distinguished elevated perhaps by a mirage in their seething valley, like a coin in a basin, all the earth beyond the pond appeared like a thin crust insulated and floated even by the small sheet of invert interverting water, and I was reminded that this on which I dwelt was but dry land. Though the view from my door was still more contracted, I did not feel crowded or confined in the least. There was pasture enough for my imagination. The low shrub oak plateau to which the opposite shore arose stretched away toward the prairies of the west and the steppes of the Tartary, affording ample room for all the roving families of men. There are none happy in the world but beings who enjoy freely a vast horizon, said Damodara, with his herds required new and larger pastures. Both place and time were changed, and I dwelt nearer to those parts of the universe and to those eras in history which had most attracted me. Where I lived was as far off as many a region viewed nightly by astronomers. We are wont to imagine rare and delectable places in some remote and more celestial corner of the system, behind the constellation of Cassiopeia's chair, far from noise and disturbance. I discovered that my house actually had its site in such a withdrawn, but forever new and unprofaned part of the universe. If it were worth the while to settle in those parts near to the Pleiades or the Hyades, to Alderbaran or Altair, I was really there, or in equal remoteness from the life which I had left behind, dwindled and tinkling with fine array as my nearest neighbor, and to be seen only in moonless nights by him. Such was that part of creation where I had squatted. There was a shepherd that did live, and held his thoughts as high as were the mounts whereon his flocks did hourly feed him by. What should we think of the shepherd's life if his flocks always wandered to higher pastures than his thoughts? Every morning was a cheerful invitation to make my life of equal simplicity, and I may say innocence with nature herself. I have been as sincere as a worshiper of Aurora as the Greeks. I got up early and bathed in the pond. That was a religious exercise, and one of the best things which I did. They say that characters were engraven on the bathing tub of King Ching Chang to this effect. Renew thyself completely each day. Do it again and again and forever again. I could understand that. Morning brings back the heroic ages. I was as much affected by the faint burn of a mosquito making its invisible and unimaginable tour through my apartment at earliest dawn when I was sailing with door and windows open as I could be by any trumpet that ever sang of fame. It was Homer's Requiem, itself an Iliad and Odyssey in the air, singing its own wrath and wanderings. There was something cosmical about it, a standing advertisement till forbidden of the everlasting vigor and fertility of the world. The morning, which is most memorable season of the day, is the awakening hour. Then there is at least somnolence in us, and for an hour at least, some part of us awakes which slumbers all the rest of the day and night. Little is to be expected of that day, if it can be called a day, to which we are not awakened by our genius, but by the mechanical nudgings of some servitor, not wakened by our only newly acquired force and aspirations from within, accompanied by the undulations of celestial music instead of factory bells, and our fragrance filling the air to a higher life than we fell asleep from, and thus the darkness bear its fruit, and prove itself to be good, no less than the light. 
That man who does not believe that each day contains an earlier, more sacred and auroral hour than he has yet profaned has despaired of life and is pursuing a descending and darkening way. After a partial cessation of his sensuous life, the soul of man, or its organs rather, are reinvigorated each day, and his genius tries again at what noble life it can make. All memorable events, I should say, transpire in the morning time and in a morning atmosphere. The Vedas say, all intelligences awake with the morning. Poetry and art and the fair stand most memorable of the actions of men, and they date from such an hour. All poets and heroes like Memnon are the children of Aurora and emit their music at sunrise. To him whose elastic and vigorous thought keeps pace with the sun, the day is a perpetual morning. It matters not what the clocks say or the attitudes and labors of men. Morning is when I'm awake and there is a dawn in me. Moral reform is the effort to throw off sleep. Why is it that men give so poor an account of their day if they have not been slumbering? They are not such poor calculators. If they have not been overcome with drowsiness, they would have performed something. The millions are awake enough for physical labor, but only one in a million is awake enough for an effective intellectual exertion. Only one in a hundred millions to a poetic or a divine life. To be awake is to be alive. I have never yet met a man who is quite awake. How could I have looked him in the face? We must learn to re reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn, which does not forsake us in our soundest sleep. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. It is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue and so to make a few objects beautiful but it is far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look, which morally we can do. To affect the quality of the day, that is the highest of the arts. Every man is tasked to make his life, even its details, worthy of the contemplation of his most elevated and critical hour. If we refused, or rather used up such paltry information as we get, the oracles would distinctly inform us how this might be done. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out the marrow of life to live so sturdily and spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner, and to reduce it to its lowest terms. And if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it, and publish its meanness to the world? Or, if it were sublime, to know it by experience, and be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion, for most men, it appears to me, are in a strange uncertainty about it, whether it is of the devil or of God, and to have somewhat hastily concluded that it is the chief end of man here, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Still, we live meanly, like ants. Through the fable tells us we were long ago changed into men. Like pygmies, we fight with cranes. It is error upon error and clout upon clout and our best virtue has for its occasion a superfluous and inevitable wretchedness. Our life is frittered away by detail. An honest man has hardly need to count more than his ten fingers, or in extreme cases he may add his ten toes and lump the rest. Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. I say let your affairs be as two or three, and not a hundred or a thousand. Instead of a million, count half a dozen and keep your accounts on your thumbnail. In the midst of this chopping sea of civilized life, such are the clouds and storms and quicksands and thousand and one items to be allowed for, that a man has to live, if he would not founder and go to the bottom and not make his port at all by dead reckoning, and he must be a great calculator indeed who succeeds. Simplify, simplify. Instead of three meals a day, if it be necessary, eat but one. 
instead of 100 dishes, five, and reduce other things in proportion. Our life is like a German confederacy made up of petty states with its boundary forever fluctuating, so that even a German cannot tell you how it is bounded at any moment. The nation itself, with all its so-called internal improvements, which, by the way, are all external and superficial, is just such an unwieldy and overgrown establishment, cluttered with furniture and tripped up by its own traps, ruined by luxury and heedless expense, by want of calculation and a worthy aim. As the million households in the land, and the only cure for it as for them in a rigid economy, a stern and more than Spartan simplicity of life and elevation of purpose. It lives too fast. Men think that it's essential that the nation have commerce and export ice and talk through a telegraph and ride 30 miles an hour without a doubt, whether they do or not. But whether we should live like baboons or like men is a little uncertain. If we do not get out sleepers and forge rails and devote days and nights to the work, but go to tinkering upon our lives to improve them, who will build railroads? And if railroads are not built, how shall we get to heaven in season? But if we stay at home and mind our business, who will want railroads? We do not ride on the railroad. It rides upon us. Did you ever think that those sleepers are, are that, un that underlie the railroad? Each one is a man, an Irishman, or a Yankee man. The rails are laid on them, and they are covered with sand, and the cars run smoothly over them. They are sound sleepers, I assure you. And every few years, a new lot is laid down and run over, so that if some have the pleasure of riding on a rail, others have the misfortune to be ridden upon. And when they run over a man that is walking in his sleep, a supernumerary sleeper in the wrong position, and wake him up, they suddenly stop the cars and make a hue and cry about it, as if this were an exception. I am glad to know that it takes a gang of men for every five miles to keep the sleepers down and level in their beds as it is, for this is a sign that they may sometime get up again. Why should we live with such hurry and waste of life? We are determined to be starved before we are hungry. Men say that the stitch in time saves nine, and so they take a thousand stitches today to save nine tomorrow. As for work, we haven't any of any consequence. We have the St. Vitus's dance and cannot possibly keep our heads still. If I should only give a few pulls at the parish bell rope, as for a fire, that is, without setting the bell, there's hardly a man on his farm in the outskirts of Concord, notwithstanding that press of engagements, which was his excuse so many times this morning. Nor a boy, nor a woman, I might almost say, but would forsake all and follow that sound, not mainly to save property from the flames, but if we will confess the truth, much more to see it burn, since burn it must, and we, be it known, did not set it on fire, or to see it put out and have a hand in it, if that is done as handsomely. Yes, if it even were the parish church itself, Hardly a man takes a half hour's nap after dinner, but when he wakes, he holds up his head and asks, What's the news? As if the rest of mankind had stood his sentinel. Some give directions to be waked every half hour, doubtless, for no other purpose. And then, to pay for it, they tell what they have dreamed. After a night's sleep, the news is as indispensable as the breakfast. Pray, tell me anything new that has happened to a man anywhere on this globe and he reads it over his coffee and rolls that a man has had his eyes gouged out this morning on the Washita River, never dreaming the while that he lives in the dark, unfathomed mammoth cave of this world and has but the rudiment of an eye himself. For my part, I could easily do without the post office. I think that there are very few important communications made through it. To speak critically, I never received more than one or two letters in my life. I wrote this some years ago that were worth the postage. The penny post is commonly an institution through which you seriously offer a man that penny for his thoughts, which is so often safely offered in jest. And I'm sure that I never read any memorable news in a newspaper. If we read of one man robbed, or murdered, or killed by accident, or one house burned, or one vessel wrecked, or one steamboat blown up, or one cow run over on the Western Railroad, or one mad dog killed, or one lot of grasshoppers in the winter, we never need read of another one is enough. If you're acquainted with the principle, what do you care for a myriad instances and applications? To a philosopher, all news, as it's called, is gossip, 
and they who edit and read it are old women over their tea. Yet not a few are greedy after this gossip. There was such a rush as I hear the other day at one of the offices to learn the foreign news by the last arrival, that several large squares of plate glass belonging to the establishment were broken by the pressure, news which I seriously think a ready wit might write a twelve month or twelve years beforehand with sufficient accuracy. As for Spain, for instance, if you know how to throw in Don Carlos and the Infanta and Don Pedro and Seville and Granada from time to time in the right proportions, they may have changed the names a little since I saw the papers, and serve up a bullfight when the other entertainments fail, it will be true to the letter and give us as good an idea of the exact state or ruin of things in Spain as the most succinct and lucid reports under this head in the newspapers. And as for England, almost the last significant scrap of news from that quarter was the revolution of 1649. And if you've learned the history of her crops for an average year, you never need attend to that thing again unless your speculations are of merely a pecuniary character. If one may judge who rarely looks into the newspapers, nothing new does ever happen in foreign parts. A French Revolution not accepted. What news? How much more important to know with that which is never old? Kiyu Heyu, great dignitary of the state of Wei, sent a man to Kung Sao to know his news. Kung Sao caused the messenger to be seated near him and questioned him in these terms. What is your master doing? The messenger answered with respect. My master desires to diminish the number of his faults, but he cannot come to the end of them. The messenger being gone, the philosopher remarked, What a worthy messenger! What a worthy messenger! The preacher, instead of vexing the ears of drowsy farmers on their day of rest at the end of the week, for Sunday is the fit conclusion of an ill-spent week, and not the fresh and brave beginning of a new one, with this one other draggle tale of a sermon, should shout with thundering voice, Pause! Avast! Why so seeming fast, but deadly slow? Shams and delusions are esteemed for soundest truths, while reality is fabulous. If men could steadily observe realities only, and not allow themselves to be deluded, life to compare it with such things as we know would be like a fairy tale and the Arabian Nights entertainments. If we respected only what is inevitable and has a right to be, music and poetry would resound along the streets. When we are unhurried and wise, we perceive that only great and worthy things have any permanent and absolute existence, that petty fears and petty pleasures are but the shadow of reality. This is always exhilarating and sublime. By closing the eyes and slumbering and consenting to be deceived by shows, men establish and conform their daily life of routine and habit everywhere, which still is built on purely illusory foundations. Children who play life discern its true law and relations more clearly than men, who fail to live it worthily, but who think that they are wiser by experience, that is, by failure. I have read in a Hindu book that there was a king's son, who, being expelled in infancy from his native city, was brought up by a forester, and growing up to maturity in that state, imagined himself to belong to the barbarous race for which, which he lived. One of his father's ministers, having discovered him, revealed to him what he was, and the misconception of his character was removed, and he knew himself to be a prince. So, soul, continues the Hindu philosopher, from the circumstances in which it's placed, mistakes its own character, and to the truth is revealed to it by some holy teacher, and then it knows itself to be Brahma. I perceive that we inhabitants of New England live this mean life that we do because our vision does not penetrate the surface of things. We think that it is which it appears to be. If a man could walk through this town and see only the reality, where, think you, would the mill dam go to? If he should give us an account of the realities he beheld there, we should not recognize the place in his description. Look at a meeting house or a courthouse, or a jail, or a shop, or a dwelling house, and say what thing really is before a true gaze, and they would all go to pieces in your account of them. Men esteem truth remote, in the outskirts of the system, behind the farthest star before Adam and after the last man. In eternity, there is indeed something true and sublime. But all these times and places and occasions are now and here. God himself culminates in the present moment and will never be more divine in the lapse of all the ages. And we're unable to ap apprehend at all what is sublime and noble only by the perpetual instilling and drenching of the reality that surrounds us. 
the universe constantly and obediently answers to our conceptions. Whether we travel fast or slow, the track is laid for us. Let us spend our lives in conceiving then. The poet or the artist never yet had so fair and noble a design, but some of his posterity at least could accomplish it. Let us spend one day as deliberately as nature, and not be thrown off the track by every nutshell and mosquito's wing that falls on the rails. Let us rise early and fast, or break fast, gently and without perturbation. Let company come and let company go. Let the bells ring and the children cry, determined to make a day of it. Why should we knock under and go with the stream? Let us not be upset and overwhelmed in that terrible rapid and whirlpool called a dinner situated in the meridian shallows. Weather this danger and you are safe, for the rest of the way is downhill. With unrelaxed nerves, with morning vigor, sail by it, looking another way, tied to the mast like Ulysses. If the engine whistles, let it whistle to this horse for its pains. If the bell rings, why should we run? We will consider what kind of music they are like. Let us settle ourselves and work and wedge our feet downward through the mud and slush of opinion and prejudice and tradition and delusion and appearance, that alivision which covers the globe through Paris and London, through New York and Boston and Concord, through church and state, through poetry and philosophy and religion, till we come to a hard bottom and rocks in place, which we can call reality, and say, this is and no mistake. And then begin, having a point of pui, fall below freshet and frost and fire, a place where you might found a wall or a state, or set a lamp post safely, or perhaps a gauge, not a nilometer, but a realometer, that future ages might know how deep a freshet of shams and appearances had gathered from time to time. If you stand right fronting and face to face to a fact, you will see the sun glimmer on both of its surfaces as if it were a scimitar, and feel its sweet edge dividing you through a heart and marrow, and so you'll happily conclude your mortal career. Be it life or death, we crave only reality. If we are really dying, let us hear the rattle in our throats and feel cold in the extremities. If we are alive, let us go about our business. Time is but the stream I go a-fishing in. I drink at it, but while I drink, I see the sandy bottom and detect how shallow it is. Its thin current slides away, but eternity remains. I would drink deeper, fish in the sky whose bottom is pebbly with stars. I cannot count one. I know not the first letter of the alphabet. I've always been regretting that I was not as wise as the day I was born. The intellect is a cleaver. It discerns and rifts its way into the secret of things. I do not wish to be any more busy with my hands than is necessary. My head is hands and feet. I feel all my best faculties concentrated in it. My instinct tells me that my head is an organ for burrowing, as some creatures use their snout and forepaws, and with it I would mine and burrow my way through these hills. I think that the richest vein is somewhere hereabouts, so by the divining rod and thin rising vapors I judge, and here I will begin to mine.